Hello. This is Living Room Talk, a video blog focused mainly on current issues and events. The topic tonight is the nomination of Judge Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court. My name is John Graham, and in past sessions I've told you probably more than you want to know about me. If you're new here, I'll just tell you that I'm a lifelong adventurer, a former Foreign Service officer, a writer, a speaker, a social and political activist, and for over three decades, a leader of the Giraffe Heroes Project, a global nonprofit that moves people to stick their necks out for the common good. I have degrees from Harvard and Stanford, neither of which I've ever used to make a living. If you want to learn more, it's at johngraham.org. Now to that Supreme Court nomination. <clears throat> Bottom line, Amy Coney Barrett is virtually certain to be confirmed as the next justice of the United States Supreme Court. Like every other Supreme Court nominee, she bobbed and weaved her way through her confirmation hearing, but barring Connecting with some Hail Mary pass, there's nothing the Democrats in the Senate can do now to block her confirmation, which will establish a fairly solid six to three conservative majority on the court. The conservatives, of course, are ecstatic. This is something they've worked for for decades. For some liberals, this is the end of the world as they know it. Let me take a deep breath offer my own perspective. First, who is Amy Coney Barrett? She is, as you no doubt know, a staunch Catholic conservative, apparently happily married and with seven kids, two of them black Haitian kids she and her husband adopted, and one of them a birth child born with Down syndrome. So as a fervent pro-life advocate, she has certainly walked her talk. By all accounts, Barrett is a serious, competent person, a scholar with uh, an impeccable personal life. She's smart, tough, thoughtful, and a person of high personal integrity. The American Bar Association rates her as fully qualified for the nation's highest court. If she were a liberal, Democrats would be thrilled with her. How will Barrett rule on the Supreme Court? Well, first let's ask, how far to the right is she anyway? Barrett has served on the 7th U.S. Court of Appeals for almost three years now, long enough to establish herself as one of the more conservative judges on that circuit. But she's not off the charts, but in line with other well-respected conservative judges on that court. Her rulings put her closer to the middle of the court on cases involving employment discrimination, labor, and criminal defendants, but she's been much more conservative in cases involving hot-button issues like gun rights, voting rights, and a woman's right to choose. Will Barrett be her own person on the court? I think there's every indication that she will be. As a student, as a lawyer, as a judge, she seems to have pretty much charted her own course. You may not like that course, but it seems to be a genuine expression of who she is. Of course, Trump chose her for the court because she's a staunch conservative, but that doesn't mean she'll be a shill for him or any other future president, political party, or corporate interest. From my research, I think it's a good bet that her rulings from the bench will continue to be motivated by her deeply held interpretations of the law. <laughs> yes, I understand. That's exactly what concerns some of you, and it probably should. Finally, in my opinion, I don't think it's fair to cast her as a character from The Handmaid's Tale because of her religious beliefs. By all accounts, her marriage is a balanced partnership. 
More about Barrett's Catholicism in a minute. More important is how Barrett thinks about the law. Judge Barrett, in describing her judicial philosophy, has called herself a strict originalist in the tradition of her mentor, the late arch-conservative justice Antonin Scalia. What does being an originalist mean? Bear with me while I take you into a legal thicket on this issue, because it's essential to an understanding of how Barrett might shape our future. An originalist like Barrett understands the Constitution to have the meaning that it had when it was ratified in 1789. Her interpretation, she says, draws from, and I quote, what reasonable persons living at that time would have understood the ordinary meaning of the text to be. And that meaning doesn't change over time. She goes on, and it's not up to me to update it or to infuse my own policy views into it. I think I'm in good company in thinking that this is a major reason why Barrett should not be put on the highest court in the land. For starters, those reasonable persons whose interpretation of the Constitution she honors were all white male property owners governing a misogynistic racist society where property included other human beings. Are these Really, the people whose views we want to guide us in the present day? And interpreting the Constitution as literally as possible, well, that makes it a dead document, not a vibrant guide for a modern society. The founders didn't know anything about oh, vaccines, electricity, antibiotics, the internal combustion engine, uh, the idea of universal human rights, birth control, nuclear weapons, internet. More importantly, originalists like Barrett, as she said in her confirmation hearings, don't believe the Constitution protects rights that are not specifically named. But the Constitution does not, for example, actually enumerate the right to vote, or the right to marriage, or the right to privacy, or the right to travel, or many other rights we take for granted. Neither did the Constitution address social issues key to the pursuit of happiness in an advanced nation in 2020, such as health care, a good education, and a safe retirement. Now, here's a key point. Originalists like Scalia and Barrett conclude that the Supreme Court should not be in the business of imposing its views of social mores on the American people. Instead, Originalists say that the issues not specifically mentioned in the Constitution should be addressed and resolved not by the courts, but by legislators at the federal and state levels. Yeah, you got it. This shunting of hot-button social issues to legislatures across the land has obvious implications for previous support Supreme Court rulings like Roe v. Wade. So let's take a look at what Barrett might do with Roe versus Wade. <clears throat> There's no doubt that Barrett is personally anti-choice, and she believes that life begins at conception. But her colleagues on the Seventh Circuit Court cite several examples from her three years on that court, where she demonstrated that she can separate her personal views on abortion and abortion-related issues from her judicial decision-making. In her own words, <clears throat> and I quote, if there is ever a conflict between a judge's personal conviction and that judge's duty under the rule of law, then it is never, ever permissible for that judge to follow their personal convictions in the decision of the case rather than what the law requires. Okay, well, with Roe v. Wade again on the horizon, Bar Barrett's ability to separate her personal views from her judicial rulings will be tested as never before. But even if she passes this test, 
As we've just noted, Barrett is an originalist, and that means that because the Constitution does not say anything about abortion, then the matter should be left up to state and federal legislatures, not the courts. Logically, this would suggest that Barrett thinks the court should never have taken up the issue in the first place. All is not lost for pro-choice advocates, however. And that's because of a legal doctrine called <clears throat> stare decisis. It's a Latin term that refers to the legal practice of following precedent. It translates as stand by the thing decided. And it's a major reason why many jurists, even if they think an issue was originally wrongly decided, will not vote to overturn it. Stay with me again, because this is yet another trip into the legal thicket. But it's essential if you want to understand how the Supreme Court might rule on Roe v. Wade. In 2013, when she was a professor at Notre Dame, Barrett wrote an essay pointing to the strength of stare decisis, but at the same time suggesting that some room be left for some cases to be overturned. If anything, she wrote, <clears throat> The public response to controversial cases like Roe reflects public rejection of the proposition that stare decisis can declare a permanent victor in a divisive constitutional struggle. So whether Barrett honors stare decisis enough to keep Roe v. Wade on the books is simply not clear. For what it's worth, however, at her confirmation hearings, Barrett declared that she had no agenda to try to overrule current Supreme Court rulings on the issue of abortion. Even if the court doesn't overturn Roe v. Wade, there are cases percolating in lower courts nationwide that would continue to chip away at a woman's right to choose. And as an originalist, Barrett would be tempted to give state legislatures more say in the matter. Finally, as more tea leaves to read, in 2016, Barrett told an audience at Jacksonville University she believed that while Roe wouldn't be overturned, access to abortion could continue to be limited. She said, I don't think that Roe's core holding that women have a right to an abortion would change but I think the questions of whether people can get very late-term abortions or how many restrictions can be put on clinics, I think that would change." Close quote. That's enough for now. I'll be doing more talks on the Supreme Court in coming weeks, looking at the fate of the Affordable Care Act and of environmental and climate crisis policies and at the prospect of expanding the Supreme Court to bring it more in line with where the country is. Come back next Friday, 5 o'clock Pacific. Meanwhile, please comment on what you heard, like this page, share it with your friends. That's all for now from the living room.